Okay, so I'm going to go through the discussion questions from mainly Chapter 7, but there's also a little from Chapter uh, 8 and 9 um, in the rotational motion unit we just did, since I'll be out on maternity leave. And since I clearly procrastinated, um, I don't have a lot of time to edit this, so fingers crossed, hopefully uh, I can go smoothly here. Um, anyway, discussion questions I think you should know, uh, starting with Chapter 7. Number one says, the batter in a baseball game hits a home run. As he circles the bases, is his angular velocity positive or negative? So angular motion, we described the right hand rule, you know, where you kind of curl your fingers the way the thing was rotating. Uh, if your thumb was up, we would call that positive, sort of counterclockwise was positive. The other way would be negative. So, Let's see. So a baseball player would run the bases this way, curl your fingers, you know, that would be um, really the angular velocity would be up. Um, we would call that positive. Okay. Number two, viewed from somewhere in space above the North Pole, which this, where you are should be irrelevant. That's kind of the beauty of the right hand rule, um, is that, you know, whichever direction your thumb is pointing, is, you know, that's the direction of that angular turn. Uh, so where you are should matter. But anyway, um, would a point on the Earth's equator have a positive or negative angular velocity due to the Earth's rotation? So just think about um, the Earth and how it is rotating for a second. We've got you know, North America over here. Um, yeah. And put the sun wherever you want to put the sun. But remember, you know, we here on the East Coast would see the sun first. Uh, before like California does. So the Earth is rotating like that, that way. So really regardless of where you are in space, um, the Earth's rotating that way where the East Coast is going to see the sun first. Um, I would call that angular velocity up, like really towards the North Pole. Um, but our book of course calls that positive. All right, let's get it down to number four. All right, you are using a wrench to loosen a very stubborn bolt. It was very stubborn enough. You can make the job easier by using a cheater pipe. This is a piece of pipe that slides over the handle of the wrench, as shown below, making it effectively much longer, so maybe your wrench was inside about that big. Explain why this would help you loosen the nut. Well, if you're loosening a nut, you want to rotate it. Um, it is, it's not just force that would uh, help you cause a rotation. If you're trying to rotate something that's at rest, you need a torque to do that. And we had two uh, torque formulas. This is the one that would apply here, really. Uh, you know, you're probably pulling as hard as you can, whether you have the cheater pipe or you're just pulling on the wrench. So it's not really that your force is changing when you add this little pipe, but you have definitely lengthened, really, the lever arm. You've definitely lengthened this R value. So you've got a much greater torque. And torque, of course, also is related to I alpha, so that would help you um, increase the alpha, increase the angular acceleration. All right, number five. Um, five forces are applied to a door, as shown here. For each force, is the torque about the hinge positive, negative, or zero? 
So this would again be right hand rule. A little hard to see. We got A, B, C, D, and E. And I can tell right now, again, that same torque formula. They're all the same force. So it's not really the force that's going to matter here. It's the R. And also the cross product idea. That cross product meant you wanted those two things to be perpendicular. You want the force to be perpendicular to the lever arm, this, the R, the radius. And this R value is measured from the pivot point to where the force acts. So for E, from the pivot point to where the force acts, that would be my R value, really my R vector. Um, so it is one of the longest R's, so you might think, okay, they're all the same force, that's the biggest R, that would be one of the biggest torques. Um, that actually is a torque of nothing. So. E is zero because they're not perpendicular. R and F are parallel to each other, going the exact same way. So remember, R is drawn from the pivot to whichever force you're talking about. So all the R's are, of course, to the right. Um, this isn't asking about magnitude of torque. This is just asking about direction. So these two up here, I guess that's force A. I guess it's a little bit there. So force A and force C both would want to make this door rotate this way. So that kind of torque, that kind of rotation, uh, gives you a positive um, direction. So A and C are positive. Then B and D would want to make the door rotate down. Both of them are trying to make the door rotate that way, so I use my right hand, thumb would be into the board, uh, so that would really be a negative uh, torque. All right. Six, um, a screwdriver with a very thick handle requires less force to operate than one with a very skinny handle. Explain why this is so. using a screwdriver, you're of course trying to rotate something. You're trying to exert a torque on something. So again, same equation. I can provide the same torque with different forces if I have different corresponding R values. So the bigger, thicker screwdriver handle is going to have a bigger R value. Therefore, you don't need as much force to get the same torque you could from the skinnier one. All right, number eight. A common type of door stop is a wedge made of rubber. Um, is such a stop more effective when jammed under the door near or far from the hinges? Well, assuming it's going to give the same sort of force of friction either way, um, obviously, the bigger R value would be the bigger torque. So I would want to put the door jam far away from the hinges. Increase the R value, increase the torque. Alright, skip it down to 11. A 
Okay, we did this sort of last unit, but a couple center of mass, center of gravity questions. It says the two ends of the dumbbell shown below are made of the same material. Um, is the dumbbell center of gravity at point one, two, or three? Same thing as center of mass. Um, so obviously the left end looks heavier, it's the same material, so if that's bigger, it's got to be heavier. So you wouldn't pick right smack in the middle, because more of the mass is to the left. So that's got to be point one. Center mass would be at point one. Okay, 12. And these are now getting into uh, moment of inertia. Uh, that concept. So if you grasp a hammer by its lightweight handle and wave it back and forth, and then grasp it by its much heavier head and wave it back and forth, you'll find that you can wave the hammer much more rapidly in the second case when you grasp, grasp it by the head. Explain why this is so. So again, this relates to moment of inertia. These it's the same hammer, they offset the same mass. And I know this would not be the formula for this irregular shape uh, hammer, but all of the formulas for all the shapes are really based on sort of the point mass idea of mr squared. Um, so you could think of the hammer as a whole bunch of point masses, I guess, um, where this, this scenario would have the greater moment of inertia because more of the mass is farther away. So most of the mass has a big R value. Here, most of the mass has zero R value. It's right in the palm of the hand. Again, same idea with R um, from the pivot point to where the mass is located. So this would, even though they're the same mass, they're the same object, there's more moment of inertia here than here. Also, you can think of the figure skater who throws her arms out same figure skater, same mass, but she's moving her mass out. So the farther away the mass is from the rotation point, the more moment of inertia it has. And, moment, and inertia means you know, resistance to change in motion. So it has more resistance to change in motion, it would be harder to move it. All right, 13. Suppose you have two identical looking metal spheres of the same size and the same mass. One is solid, the other is hollow. Describe a simple test that you could do to determine which is which. Uh, well, I know these aren't spheres, but we did do this little demo in class. Um, you know, these two cylinders have essentially the same mass. One is sort of hollow, one is solid. Um, and what we did was we just raced them. We rolled them down a little ramp and you could tell that the one, you know, the one that would get there first would have the least moment of inertia, have the least resistance to change, so it would get going faster. So the one that gets there first has the least inertia um, and would be, again, the one where the mass is closer to the center. So if one is solid, and maybe you remember from class, uh, this black solid cylinder won the race, and that's how you could tell it was a solid sphere, not that it win the race. If it wins the race, it's got the least moment of inertia. It would be solid. Hollow, the mass is more spread out, would have a greater inertia, greater resistance to change, um, and it would take longer to get going. All right, 14, um, the moment of inertia of a uniform rod about an axis through its center is a 12th ml squared, but the moment of inertia about an axis at one end is one third mr squared. Explain why the moment of inertia is larger about uh, the end than the center. So we're talking about rotating it about the center, which would be like this, or about an end, like this. And this is clear.
clearly uh, harder to do. Obviously the same object, um, same mass, but where that mass is is different. If this is my pivot point, I've got mass much farther away uh, than I would if the pivot point were in the center. So a much greater moment of inertia if I'm trying to pivot it like this. All right, 15. Okay, wheel is rolling to the right without slipping. Rank in order from fastest to slowest the speeds of the points labeled one through five. Explain your reasoning. Okay, this is an important problem. Um, this also relates to one of your short answer questions on your, on your test. Even though we don't often deal with the rolling aspect. Um, I should mention it again. I mentioned it in class, but it's not really in the notes. So take note of this one, number 15 here. Uh, let me draw this out if I can. So there's a couple things I want you to know about rolling motion. One, it's just the combination of rotational motion and linear motion. So I'm going to draw this rolling disc twice. The first picture would be um, if it were just moving, you know, linearly, not rotating at all, just kind of sliding across the floor. So I've got one, two, three, four, five points here. And again, if it were just sliding across the floor, then every point of this disc would have the same exact velocity. It'd all be moving to the right, you know, at this exact same center of mass speed. So they're all the same, all right. Just like that. Every point moving to the right, same velocity. Now, imagine it just rotating. So not sliding to the right, but just going around in a circle. What would the velocities at each point look like? making it roll, but that also means, if it says without slipping, if there's no you know, sliding of surfaces together, that little phrase, rolling without slipping, means energy is not lost to heat, which we usually say it would be, because it's rolling without slipping. So friction is making it roll, but it's not slipping, so there's no sliding of surfaces, and we don't say energy is lost to friction. Okay, so if it is if it is um, sliding this way, let's see, friction would oppose that motion, and the friction would act this way. Therefore, causing it to rotate this way. So causing it to rotate uh, clockwise, which really be negative. Friction is providing a negative torque on this disk. Anyway, I need to know that it's rotating this way. So all my velocities at these same points, let's see. Supposed to look the same. All the velocities for rotating motion, just think sort of tangential 
um, velocities. So they're all straight line at these points, all things rotating, again, clockwise with a negative angular velocity. Um, that would mean this would be sort of tangential to the right. This point would be tangential to the left. This one would be up. Would you say the very center of it is moving? No, we'd really put no velocity on that at all, as far as rotationally speaking. All right, and then this point, which appears to have half the radius, sort of think about your, again, marching band equation. Whole wheel has the same angular speed, but if it's got half the radius, then it's going to have half the tangential linear speed. So that should be smaller, you know, by half than the outside one. All right, so that's the linear diagram. That's the rotational diagram. Now you just add these vectors together. If it's rolling, it's the combination of the two. for an instant at the bottom uh, for that one particular spot. However, at the top, linearly, that spot's going right. Rotationally, that spot's going right. So adding those vectors, a point at the top in rolling motion is actually going twice as fast as the center. And in my other physics textbook, we have a picture of a rolling wheel. And the picture shows very clearly down here, because it's not rotating there, uh, but it's very blurry at the top, because the top is moving twice as fast. All right, and then combining the other vectors, so the center of mass would still be moving, you know, just that original velocity to the right. Um, but these do kind of give, you know, a little triangle, you have to go right and up. Something like that. So, if we're ranking the speeds of these positions, um, the very top, which is 1, would be the greatest speed. So, V1 is greater than everything else. Those were two uh, velocity vectors of the same magnitude, just added head to tail. That's going to be the biggest possible velocity vector. All right, coming in next is going to be position two, position three, position four, and then really zero for the bottom. So it really wasn't ordered. V1 is greater than V2, greater than V3, greater than V4, greater than V5. Okay, and let me try to tie this in again to the short answer question you're going to see. Um, you do need to understand that rolling motion is, of course, a combination of linear and rotational. And you also need to understand uh, the forces acting on a rolling body. So let me redraw this a second. Your short answer question asks you to draw a free body diagram for a rolling disc, rolling wheel or something. And it says to draw those forces at their points of application. So, just mean where, if you had to pick one spot where that force was acting, where would it be? Well, we know we always have weight for any object. Weight straight down, but if you had to pick one spot where that force was acting, we would pick the center of mass. So we would pick right there. All right, so at its point of application, weight is right from the middle, straight down. 
Next, you have a normal force from the surface straight up. But if you had to pick that one point where it's acting, you would pick at the surface. So that would be your normal force. Again, starting down here. And then, of course, the rolling without slipping idea. Why is it rolling at all? Well, it's rolling because of friction. Um, so if it you know, wants to go to the right, friction's acting left. You did it for color. And that would be really the three forces acting on the rolling disc. Weight down, normal up, and friction. Again, friction's from the surface, so draw it at the point of contact with the surface. Again, it's not sliding, so we say energy is not lost. Um, and I believe there's a question about torque. So you got these three forces. Which force is providing a torque? Well, if you think about R cross F, um, and you know it's rolling about the center. Weight is not providing a torque. The weight's not making it want to roll. Uh, certainly it's a force, but there's no R value at all. Weight would act right here at the center, and there's no distance away from the center there. So it's not weight. Uh, normal force, on the other hand, is not acting at the pivot point, but the R value, uh, again, is um, from the pivot to where the force is acting. So throw in a whole other vector here. That would be R. From the pivot to where the force is acting. It's like the lever arm. And even though they're opposite directions, they're still not perpendicular. They're the same way. So normal force isn't trying to make it rotate anyway either. The only force that is trying to make it rotate, the only force that is providing a torque is friction. Um, and since I mentioned the energy, I believe this goes on one step farther, further, and asks about uh, a wheel rolling down an incline versus a chunk of ice rolling down an incline, or not rolling, sliding down an incline, like frictionless ice sliding down an incline, wheel rolling down an incline, and it says which one is moving faster at the bottom. And you might think, well, in their same mass, you know, same potential energy at the top, true. Same masses, same heights, same gravity. Definitely have the same potential energy at the top. Do they have the same kinetic energy at the bottom, and therefore the same speeds at the bottom? Yes and no. They have the same kinetic energy at the bottom, but the rolling wheel has two types of kinetic energy. It has linear kinetic energy, and it has rotational kinetic energy. And that total linear and rotational kinetic energy would equal the original potential. But because some of its energy is going into making it roll, it will not be going as fast at the bottom as the chunk of ice is. There's no extra energy going into making the ice rotate. So feel free to look back over this little chunk. This is some good info, I think, for your short answer question number one on your test. I'll try to give you a hint for the next one as well. All right, 16 next. to walk on top of a barrel as it rolls. It is much easier to do this if the barrel is full than if it is empty. Why is this so? Um, well, this just gets back to moment of inertia. Uh, if it's full, you don't have much bigger mass, so much bigger um, moment of inertia. 
And again, inertia means resistance to change in motion. So it's got more resistance to change. It would be easier to stay on top of it without falling off. All right, just making sure that was still still recording. All right, 17, couple, couple of multiple choice. Okay, 17, a nut needs to be tightened with a wrench. Which force shown below will apply the greatest torque? Okay, so back to a little more basic torque. Uh, just R cross F, the biggest R, the biggest F, that would be your biggest torque. And of course, making them be perpendicular would maximize that. So, um, R for B, you know, be that way, even though they're opposite directions there, would provide no torque. B's got no torque because uh, there's no perpendicular, it's not, the force not perpendicular to that lever arm. B would definitely, I mean, it's just like pushing on a wrench, trying to make it rotate enough. That would not work. A provides some torque, sure. C would definitely be bigger, though, because it's a bigger R value. But what about D? Is D the same as C? Same forces, same R value. But which one is perpendicular? C would provide more torque. You definitely want to push on the wrench that way and sort of pulling in on it. All right, 19. A uh, machine is made of two pieces with centers of gravity shown below, which could be the center of gravity of the entire piece. All right, this is a little more from last unit, but that's okay. You can easily figure that out. So you got this piece, and then like that sideways L. So the center of gravity for piece one is right here. That means you can consider all the mass to be located at that spot. Center of gravity for piece two is not even on the object, but that does make sense looking at its shape. So you could consider all the mass of the little L to be right there. So where is the center of mass of everything? Well, it would have to be right in between these. So it's got to be D. All right, 22. These two, I think, are a little longer. Or at least this one is. Uh, two horizontal rods are each held up by vertical strings tied to their ends. So. Um, rod 1 has a length L, mass M. Okay, rod 2 has length 2L, mass 2M. So, try to make it twice as big. And they're both just hanging by these ropes. So rod one, rod two. Each rod then has one of its supporting strings cut all right, it's cut, so it's going to start to fall down like this. Say over here. Um, causing the rod to begin pivoting about the end that's still tied. Which rod has a larger initial angular acceleration? All right, angular acceleration. Um, if I do some kinematic stuff, I could, I could work with that, like if I knew the time it was swinging, like what angle was swept out in that time, um, I could maybe deal with that. But I also know angular acceleration comes from uh, this torque formula, moment of inertia times alpha, that is angular acceleration. And I know I have another torque formula, which is R cross F. Um,
So let's see. So if I wanted to know about the angular acceleration, alpha, I could do r cross f divided by i. Uh, but that is a lot of stuff i got to plug in. So it's a little tedious problem here. Um, let's just start with the top. r cross f for rod 1. Well, what force is providing the torque? Uh, I didn't draw a free body diagram, I should have. Uh, there's definitely a tension force here. But it's rotating down, so there's got to be some other force down. And this is my pivot point. The other string was cut. So the only other force we need is weight. And we really should draw weight again from the center of mass. So the R for rod 1 is half L, okay, because the whole length of the rod was L, so that distance to the pivot, um, from pivot to weight, is half L. The force is the weight, so weight is mg, and those things are perpendicular, and then the I, um, you should look it up. It, it does say for a rod about its end. And we had that in a previous problem. That was a third. So this is just about like a formula I'm looking up here. One third ML squared. And for rod one, it just is M and it is L. So. Alright, so masses cancel out. Uh, one L cancels out. So it looks like, and if you've got you know, a third in the denominator, you kind of flip that up to the top. So I've got 3 halves uh, g over l. That will be the angular acceleration for rod 1. Rod 2. Same thing, r cross f over i. So what force is providing the torque for rod 2? Still the weight, and it would still act at the center mass. Here's my pivot point. Um, that r value, though, if rod 2 has length 2L, would just be L, because the weight acts right smack in the center. Um, force force causing the torque is the weight, so still mg, but it's 2m. And then all over my moment of inertia formula, the one-third ml squared. But of course, m is 2m, and l is 2l. And that 2L is squared. So I'm going to cancel out again the mass. The two, I got 2M on the top, 2M on the bottom. And I've got 1L on the top. Oh, let's finish it up here. And I've got 1L. Or, I'm sorry, I've got L squared on the bottom, so that will still leave me an L on the bottom. But I've got a 2 squared, so I've got 4, uh, 4 thirds on the bottom, or flip it, 3 fourths. Alright, so if you trust my math there, that would simplify down to 
3 fourths uh, g over L for alpha 2, or 3 halves g over L for alpha 1. Uh, so that means, of course, alpha 1 is bigger. We get greater angular acceleration for the smaller rod. All right, let me log back in, sorry. So close, at least for that chapter. There's two left in this chapter. We still have some more to do. Um, 23 and 24 for the rotational motion of baseball has a thick, heavy barrel and a thin, light handle. If you want to hold a baseball bat on your palm so it balances vertically, you should do what? Similar to the question with the hammer, um, to make it easier to balance, you would want greater resistance to change. You'd want a greater moment of inertia, and that depends on how far away the mass is. So you would want you know, the thin end in your hand, the thick end up top. Um, so you want, let's see, put the end of the handle in your palm with the barrel up. Check. Yeah, the more inertia would have the barrel up, so that's it. Uh, that would be easier to just keep there. It doesn't, it's not going to want to rotate as much as that orientation. All right, and number 24 is just kind of understanding radians. Particle undergoing circular motion stops on the positive y-axis. So either here or here. Uh, just know your roughly your unit circle. I mean, so long as you know that a full circle is 2 pi, you know, 180 degrees is pi, then if it stops on the y-axis, it's some, like, multiple of half pi. If it stop up there, it'd be pi over 2, which is your first choice. So I see all these little uh, choices with half in there. That seems fine. It's the pi that stands out to me. Pi radians would be on the x-axis. That would be 180 degrees. So that would not describe the particle being on the y-axis. Okay, that was most of them. That's chapter 7. Still need to do a few from chapter 9 and chapter 8, so hang tight. Okay, these are angular momentum questions, still rotational motion stuff. Rank in order from largest to smallest the angular momenta L1 through L5 of the ball shown in that picture. So if I'm thinking angular momentum, I'm thinking regular momentum, you know, I think mass times velocity. That's your linear momentum formula, the conservation of momentum, things colliding. Um, relating that to the rotational world, instead of just m, I would have i for moment of inertia, linear inertia is based off mass, and then instead of velocity, linear velocity, we have angular velocity for omega. Now, these are little point masses going in a circle, 
So that gives me mr squared for the i. But I don't know omega. These are not in radians per second. These little velocities are all meters per second. So you can relate angular and linear with marching band equation. V equals omega r. So just divide by r. Omega is V over r. Which if I plug in here means r is going to go away. And I just have m r v. So for a point mass rotating in a circle, um, if you know the linear speed, you could use m r v. So all I need to do is just really multiply all three of these numbers. You've got the mass, you've got the radius, you've got the velocity. So number one, two times two times two, four times two is eight. And this would be kilogram meters per second. Sorry, kilogram meters squared, because you've got meters and velocity and the radius. All right, two times three times one, six. Two times one times three. Six. Four times two times one, eight. Four times two times two, all right, eight times two, 16. So five is definitely the biggest. One and four would tie at eight, and two and three would be next at six. Kilogram, meter squared per second. So that's angular momentum. Okay, and then these three, 16, 17, 18. Uh, Monica stands at the edge of a circular platform that is slowly rotating on a frictionless axle. She then walks toward the opposite edge, passing through the platform's center. All right, there she is. Uh, so she's just going to walk straight through, but while it's rotating, describe the motion of the platform as she makes her trip. Well, um, momentum is conserved, frictionless, uh, frictionless axle. She is she's moving around in here, but there's there's only internal forces acting. Um, so, I know it's not an ice skater per se, but think about the ice skater in her arms. Um, she's got greater inertia when her arms are out, and therefore she's moving slower. She's a little lower angular speed. Moves her arms in, when mass comes in, she speeds up. She's tucked in, she's going faster in that circle. So, as Monica walks towards the center, the speed's going to um, increase, because her eye is decreasing. So she walks towards the center, uh, moment of inertia is going down, speed's going up, figure skater, mass moving in. As she passes the center, now the eye's going back up, so the speed's going back down. Okay, so it'll speed up and then it'll slow down once she passes the center. All right, 17. Um, Interesting question. If the Earth warms significantly, the polar ice caps will melt. The water will move from the poles near the Earth's rotation axis uh, and just spread out. In principle, this will change the length of the day. Um, will the length of the day increase or decrease? Thing. Um, so we have the same mass for the Earth, regardless of where the water is. But if you are moving that mass away from the rotational point, like the ice skater spreading her arms out, then the moment of inertia is going to go up, which therefore would mean 
that the whole angular speed um, of the Earth is going down, at least slightly. So moment of inertia goes up, angular speed goes down. Radius of the Earth is not really changing. So if the angular speed's going down, the linear speed's going down. Marching band equation. All right, the linear speed, you know, slowing down. Just going to swap places here. So the linear speed of the Earth is going down. Um, and this is just essentially our you know, displacement over time formula, like the circumference of the Earth. That still wouldn't change. So the distance we would travel is still the same. But if we're doing that slower, if we're dividing by a smaller denominator, uh, then the time would increase. So would the length of the day increase or decrease? It would increase. Interesting question, I think. At least slightly. All right, 18. Sorry, I scroll down. Hold on. All right, 18. The discs shown have equal mass. Is the angular momentum of disc two on the right? larger than, smaller than, or equal to the angular momentum of disk 1. Explain. Okay, so we're just doing um, momentum is I omega. So they have equal mass. Is the angular momentum of the disk 2 on the right larger than, smaller than, or equal to disk 1? So, we, it does say disk. So we should know that form and be able to look it up at least. Um, the I value for a disk um, is the one half mR squared. For a hoop, it's just mR squared. And then times omega. So for disk one, that's exactly what I would have. For disk two, I would have one half um, that equal mass m. That radius, however, is double. But the angular speed is half. So does the double just sort of cancel out the half? No, because you're squaring the double. So you're really going to have you know, factor of four here, factor of half, so an increased factor of two overall. So the angular momentum is greater for disk two. Don't just think this double would cancel out this half because you are squaring the double. Okay. And then I've had a few questions from chapter eight, um, and that was mainly about equilibrium. And before I get to that, um, we're just talking about angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum. A lot of times the questions deal with the shape itself sort of changing, figure skater spreading your arms out, the girl walking across the rotating platform. Um, but angular momentum can also relate to collisions. And I hope you had at least one or two homework problems with a collision. But you do have one that's part of your short answer. 
um, on your test. So I just wanted to give you a hint there as well. So you have, again, like rotating rod and, I don't know, some kind of ball that's going to hit it. Um, so even though the ball is moving linearly, um, we can still talk about the collision with conservation of angular momentum, which you should because uh, this thing would rotate. This is the pivot. Um, it would be much easier to talk about conservation of angular momentum than to try to do like the linear momentum of each little point. Um, but even though that's moving linearly, we can uh, pretend at the moment of contact, not pretend, but we can talk about the angular momentum at the moment of contact. So if this rod is at rest, the only thing initially with angular momentum is this point mass. So again, I omega initial equals I omega final. Um, so for the point mass, a little ball hitting it, you would use mR squared um, for the moment of inertia. And even though it doesn't have angular speed, you can still relate that with the marching band equation. You can still say that uh, V equals omega R and just divide by R to substitute in for the angular speed, if you know a linear speed instead. So that would still be the angular momentum of the ball at this moment right here where it's got you know, this R value. Um, then it might depend on what it's going to do after that. Is it going to bounce? Is it going to stick? Um, that depends on the problem. If it sticks, you know, you'd have to do mR squared would be the moment of inertia of the ball um, plus the inertia of the rod itself, which again, you can look up And all of that together is moving with the same angular speed. So I just want you to be aware that you can use conservation of angular momentum for collisions, even if one object is moving linearly initially. Um, if they rotate, though, after the collision, analyze conservation of angular momentum, not linear momentum. Okay, but back to the chapter eight questions. All right, number one, um, an object is acted upon by two and only two forces that are of equal magnitude and oppositely directed. Is the object necessarily in equilibrium or in static equilibrium? Does that mean it's in static equilibrium means not only that it's not moving like left, right, up, down, but it's also not rotating. It's completely still. So can we have two forces oppositely directed and mean that it's in static equilibrium? Not necessarily. Um, I could have like a pivot here. Those two forces could be equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, but if they have different R values away from a pivot, uh, then it would rotate. This force at the end would cause a greater torque than this force in the middle. So is the object necessarily in static equilibrium? No, you can't necessarily know that unless you know where the forces are acting. All right, next one. Uh, sketch a force acting at point P that would make the rod B in static equilibrium. Okay, well, is there only one such force? Well, as far as forces go, 
you know, that force has a component that's right and a component that's down. Um, so I really need to cancel that out. I need, a, I need a force that's left and a force that's up. And of equal magnitude if forces are going to be balanced. acting at the pivot. Um, so as far as torques go, I feel like this is not possible unless there's a force I'm freaking like, unless there should be a force there that I'm not thinking about, which there easily could be, but Sketch a force at point P that will make the rod be in static equilibrium. Again, as far as forces go, I need something left and up. But as far as torques go, um, if this is not to rotate, then um, I need to have equal torques. And so this is R cross F at the end here, but this is looking like you know half R. So I would need twice the force, at least twice the component to the right. the size of this component because it's half the radius. So as far as torques go, that would balance out. As far as forces go, um, that wouldn't be balanced though. I guess the pivot's supposed to make it... Well, as far as forces go, you, know, you have more force left than you do right. So perhaps we are supposed to assume that this pivot is also, you know, providing a force to the right. Anywho, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused about the question myself on that one. But to be in static equilibrium, forces have to balance and torques have to balance. Could a ladder on a level floor lean against a wall in static equilibrium if there were no frictional forces? You can probably just imagine that. You know, if this was frictionless, could you do this? Well, no. If this were frictionless, um, then the weight of the ladder is going to pull the ladder down. This would slide out. Uh, so could it just lean there? No. The center of mass is not over this supporting point. Just like some of the center mass um, demos we did. You know, if you stand on your tiptoes, your center mass still has to be over your toes, otherwise you're going to fall. Center mass is not over that base. All right, four. That's, that's the picture. All right, four, you're using a rope to raise a tall mast, attaching the rope to the middle of the mast, as in that figure below. Um, so in A, it gives a small torque about the base of the mast. Uh, you can get a larger torque by adding this pole with a pulley on top. 
Draw a diagram showing all of the forces acting on the mast and explain why, for the same tension in the rope, adding the pole increases the torque on the mast. Well, even though they have the same tension, you're trying to pivot here, and that's your R value. You know, I just have the same R value, I can have the same tension, but remember it's that cross product. R is, or torque is R cross T. So, whichever is most perpendicular is going to win. So B is going to have the most torque. Alright, five. Um, as divers stand on tiptoes on the edge of a diving platform in preparation for a high dive, they usually extend their arms in front of them. Why do they do this? Um, well, two reasons, I suppose. One, they're increasing their rotational inertia. They're not ready to flip yet. Um, but also, the center mass has to be over the person's toes. So, you need to extend some of that mass forward to keep all of your mass still over your toes. Six, uh, where are the centers of gravity of these people doing the yoga poses? You know, if they're not falling, it's over their base, so this person's center of mass is over his feet. Her center of mass is, you know, a little shifted to the right, but at least still over her right foot, somewhere in between her right foot and left foot, closer to her right foot. Two more. All right, we've got this rod, pivots about an axle at the left end. With forces applied, as noted, the object will do what? Is it going to not move or rotate one way or the other? So as far as forces go, we've got a 40 up, a 60 up, that's 100 up, 100 down. Forces are balanced, but are torques balanced? So this tells me the pivot is the left end. R cross F for the 100 Newton force would be 2 times 100. And that would, that torque would be trying to give you a negative um, angular velocity, negative acceleration, or angular acceleration, negative torque. The 60 Newton one, however, has a radius of 3. So torques do not um, cancel out. The 60 newton force would be trying to rotate it the other way. So this one would be the positive. This one would be the negative. Um, so it will rotate clockwise. Last one, sadly it's not a short one, um, 24. This is really uh, related to an old, again, the old topic of center mass, which a couple of those questions related to. Not a bad idea to go back over them, but. Uh, the center mass formula for a collection of objects was 
the location of object 1 times mass of object 1 plus the location of object 2 times the mass of object 2 divided by the total mass. And we kind of did this with the meter sticks. I think you did stack them out one day and see how far off the table edge you could go. But anyway, this says a 30 centimeter board is placed on a table such that its right end hangs over by 8 centimeters. A second identical board is on top of the first. What is the largest distance x? Um, or what's the largest distance x can be before both boards topple over? So the goal, of course, is to keep the center of mass above the tabletop. So we can actually figure out what that should be. So from here to here, you know, the whole board is 30 centimeters, back it up 8. So that spot is 22 centimeters. So I've got to keep the center of mass at 22 centimeters, assuming this is like my origin, I'm going to call that zero. So the center of mass should be 22 centimeters. I'll just keep it in terms of centimeters. Um, so then just where is the center of object one? Well, if this board's 30 centimeters long, its center of mass is basically at 15, right smack in the middle. I don't know what its mass is. I do know they're identical things, so I'll just call it mass of 1. The other board also has its center of mass right smack in the center, but it's plus an x away from my origin. So it's still 15 centimeters, but plus x. And I don't know what its mass is, I'm just going to call it 1. Total mass of the two boards, 2. So we got 44, multiply that 2 over, equals 15 plus 15 plus So subtract 15 and 15, subtract 30, I uh, use 14. So x can be up to 14 centimeters. If you go past that, the center of mass will be off the table, no fault. All right, those are all the discussion questions for rotational motion. Um, you may again want to at least look back over sort of my hints to the short answers. Okay, we're trying to.